just turned 16. He gave him the keys to a brand new Chevrolet. 30 minutes later, there's a knock on the door. A state policeman standing there with the sun dripping wet. And he says, is this your son? Yes. He said, did you just give him a new Chevrolet? He says, yes. Well, it's at the bottom of the lake. And the father's response, instead of saying, if he were God, instead of saying, you what? He reaches in his pocket, the father would, emulating God, and says, here's the keys to a brand new Cadillac. <laughs> you wrecked the Chevy, here's a better car. That's a very interesting analogy. But isn't that like God? That's the point. Yeah, that we broke the covenant. We Jewish people were stubborn and stiff-necked, but God is establishing a new covenant with us. Friends, we got lots more on this next week. Make sure you stay tuned in. We're Messianic Minutes, and we love hearing from you. Hey, you know where our website is? It's on the internet at MessianicMinutes.com. May the Lord bless you, and may he keep you in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. Even if it feels like everyone around you is buying into worldly thinking, Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth encourages you to stand firm. It's like you can say no to the things the world offers you if you know that just ahead you have something held out to you that the world can't possibly give to you. And that is the riches that are found in Jesus Christ. This is Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss Walkabooth, author of Lies We Can Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. For Friday, September 1st, I'm Dana Gresh. This week, Nancy's honesty has been so refreshing. Maybe not always easy to hear, but refreshing. When unbiblical ideas pop up all around you, the truth is attractive. In our current series, Compromising Truth, Nancy's touched on how to handle doctrinal error and unrepentant sin. We're going to wrap this series up with a whole lot of hope. Well, if you've not been with us over the past uh, several sessions, I want to encourage you to go to reviveourhearts.com and pull up the transcripts from the last several sessions uh, because we're jumping into the middle of a tough passage here, and I don't want to have to repeat all that we've said to reset us. Uh, but if you have been with us over these last several sessions, you may be wondering, like, when you can breathe. Uh, what's going to happen here? It has kind of felt negative and heavy because it's a heavy passage. We're dealing with the letter that Jesus sent to the church in Pergamum, the third of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And it's a heavy message. It's a hard message. And uh, we've it's, it's been real quiet in this room as we've been talking about encroaching worldliness and spiritual adultery and where that comes from and, and the jealousy of God and the righteous wrath of God. But today we're going to, but we're not only going to breathe, we're going to have great joy as we see how this letter to the church wraps up with a great promise of reward for those who are faithful. So just by way of recap, uh, Revelation chapter 2, you remember the message to the church in Pergamum, comes from him who has the sharp two-edged sword. He says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, Jesus said. You have some there, not all, maybe not most, but some, at least a minority in this church, who hold, instead of holding to the name of Christ, they hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food and sacrifice to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Apparently there were some in the church at Pergamum who taught that as long as you had the right doctrinal statement, your conduct and your lifestyle didn't matter. You could be engaged with the world and worldly affairs, could do worldly things, you could look like the world, act like the world, and still call yourself a Christian. You could be a member of God's covenant community, but live as if you were a part of the world. And the message that Jesus sends to this church is, we cannot, we must not tolerate within the church those who lower the standard of truth and its application. God cares about right teaching and right living. And if we have wrong teaching, we will have wrong living. Both must be holy and according to the truth of God's word. And if we don't deal 
with these issues in the church, if we stand by and just let these things happen and turn the other way, then Christ says that he himself will come and deal with these issues. Verse 16, therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them, that is those who are promoting these teachings, with the sword of my mouth. Jesus is saying, you better deal with this. And deal with it in love and deal with it through the steps of church discipline. Going first one person, then taking another with you and going through the whole progression in Matthew chapter 18. But if, as a result of that progression, they refuse to repent, then ultimately... You must purge out the evil from among you. You must disfellowship them. They cannot continue to be members of the church in good standing if they are persisting in a lifestyle or a way of teaching or living that is contrary to God's word. Now, verse 17, Jesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I want to just reiterate that what Jesus said to the churches in the first century he is still saying to the churches in the 21st century. I've looked at these passages for months now, and I'm just so struck at how relevant and contemporary these passages are and how desperately we need these messages in our churches today. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then he says, and this is the word of hope, to the one who conquers... That is the one who doesn't give in to the world, the one who doesn't accommodate to the world, the one who doesn't give in to worldly teaching in the church, to the one who conquers, who stays faithful to my covenant. I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now, as we've said, these letters in Revelation are written to the corporate church bodies. But I love the fact that there's an individual, personal dimension to these letters. And I see that in a couple of ways. First of all, we see that each individual believer is urged and expected to listen to the message and to take it personally. To act on the message regardless of whether anyone else does or not. I think that's what it means when it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Even if the whole church doesn't hear, you hear. And to hear in the scripture means not only to hear with your physical ears, it means to hear and heed, to do something about it. And the implication there is that if every professing Christian in your church, or your city, or in the whole world, is seduced by the world's standards and falls prey to worldliness and compromise, you and I must still purpose to be faithful to the truth and the holiness of God's word. Even if everybody else falls away, and by the way, they haven't, there still are many who have not battled the need to bail, but we must still purpose to be faithful, even if all those around us are falling prey to worldliness and compromise. And then I see another aspect of the personal, the individual dimension of these letters. And that is that each individual believer who conquers, or as some of your translations say, who overcomes, each one will receive his own reward. To the one who conquers, it says, I will give some of the hidden manna. Each of these letters promises a specific reward to those who are faithful to Christ all the way to the finish line. And these rewards, they're in each of the seven letters. They symbolize the blessings that God has in store for those who love him and steadfastly hold to him. And he holds these blessings out to us. We're living as the people in Pergamum did in the place where Satan dwells, in the place where there are strong anti-God forces. It's hard to live a holy life in this world. I know that. And if you keep your eyes on the reward, the promises of God, it will help you to deal with the allure and the enticement of the world. It's like you can say no to the things the world offers you if you know that just ahead you have something held out to you that the world can't possibly give to you. And that is the riches that are found in Jesus Christ. Now, two things are promised to the faithful believers in Pergamum, and that's what I want to look at today. He promises something called hidden manna, and then he promises a white stone engraved with a name that no one knows but the one who receives it. The manna draws on Old Testament history, as we'll see in a moment, and the white stone is a symbol. 
example that's drawn from their current situation in the Roman era. Let's look at these two in order. First, the hidden manna. Do you remember that God fed his people with manna in the wilderness? Psalm 78 says, He rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Man ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. This manna in the Old Testament was supernatural. It was a gift of God. It came down from heaven. It was not something that man could make or supply. And it was satisfying. It was the bread of angels. And it was sufficient. It was in abundance. There was a daily supply of this manna. Always sufficient supply to meet everyone's need. And so God fed the Israelites with physical manna. And he has promised to feed his people with spiritual manna. In the New Testament, we read that the manna in the Old Testament is a picture of manna from heaven and a symbol for Christ, the bread of life who was sent by God from heaven and who satisfies our hunger. Let me read to you several verses out of John chapter 6, just a wonderful passage where Jesus makes this point. He says, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He. It's a person. It's He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. It was just physical food. It only sustained them temporarily. But this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And that passage, and I just read portions of it, is rather repetitive. Jesus keeps saying again and again, because he wants us to get it, I am the bread from heaven. I am the bread of life. I am the gift of God. And I'm not just like the manna they had in the Old Testament that satisfies you physically for a day, and then you've got to get more. I'm the bread of heaven, and then you have to get more, and ultimately you die. He says, I'm the bread of heaven that if you eat of me, you will have eternal life. You will never die. So the man in the wilderness kept the children of Israel alive. It provided physical sustenance. But it's a picture of Christ who gives us life and provides spiritual sustenance. So when Jesus says, I will give to you who overcome some of the hidden manna, he's talking about communion with himself intimate fellowship with himself if you turn down communion with the world you are going to have communion eternally with christ jesus is saying in effect those who believe on him who feast on him who practice his word they will live but those who believe and feast on and practice the teaching of balaam compromise with the world they will ultimately perish and remember we saw that in the last session if they don't repent i will come with the sword of my mouth and i will destroy them you want to live jesus says hold out for the heavenly manna don't compromise with the world there's some better fellowship waiting for you why is it called hidden manna it makes me think of that passage in john 4 where jesus said to his disciples when they tried to get him to eat and it was lunchtime and everybody was hungry and jesus said I have food to eat that you do not know about. He was saying that he had a source of sustenance within him that was not physical. It was not material. It was dependence on his heavenly father who gave him strength. And I think Jesus is saying there's a, there's a manna, there's a supply, there's a strength and a sustenance I can fill you with and I can give to you. It's me in you. And it's, it's something that others don't understand. It's something that they don't know about because you can't see it. It's unseen, but it's
it's very real. This spiritual food is hidden from the eyes of the unbelieving world. Well, the world sees us pursuing Christ and they think, you're nuts. Pursue after the things of the world, the baubles of the world, the sexual enticements of the world. These things are fun. These things are pleasures. And they say you need these things and you want these things. And we can say, I have food that you don't know anything about. I have Christ. They don't understand how we can be so deeply and fully satisfied with Christ that we don't need to fill our bellies with the corn husks of the world. And so... In this letter, Jesus challenges his believers. He encourages them to be faithful and to look forward to a heavenly feast, hidden manna, to practice self-denial. And those who do practice self-denial here in this world, who abstain from eating meat offered to idols on this earth, in heaven, they will eat the bread of God. They'll have a feast. Those who say no to the lust of their flesh and refuse to be seduced by worldly, illicit, sensual pleasures. Those who are willing to forfeit temporal pleasures. He says to them, you will gain eternal pleasures in the presence of God. Let me say that as we appeal to believers to turn away from worldliness, it's a mistake, I think, just to put out there for them a list of all the things you can't do. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't dress this way. You shouldn't watch that kind of stuff. There's some of those things that need to be said, but ultimately we need to get to the point of Christ offers you himself, and you'd be foolish to settle for anything or anyone less than him point people to Christ who is love, who is deeply satisfying. To those who overcome, those who conquer, I will give some of the hidden manna. Then he says I will give them also a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now, it's tempting to skip over this phrase because the fact is, as many commentators and sermons as I've read on this passage, the fact is no one knows what that means. <laughs> and they've offered a lot of suggestions. There are a lot of interpretations and explanations. The fact is we don't know what it means. However, a white stone was used in several different ways in the ancient world. And this concept would have been familiar to the first century believers in Pergamum who received this letter. So I want to tell you just a, several of the different possibilities of what a white stone could mean. For example, in those days, juries voted by casting stones into an urn. And if the jury member thought that you were not guilty, they would throw in a white stone. If they thought you were guilty, they would throw in a black stone. And so then they would pull the stones out of the urn, and if you had more white stones than black stones, you would be acquitted. If you had more black stones than white stones, you would be condemned. Now, another explanation that I read for this is that when you were acquitted in a trial, you would be given a white stone, a symbol of your being released. Regardless, the point here may be that for those who remain faithful to Christ and demonstrate that they belong to him, God will acquit them in the final judgment. They will not be condemned. That could be what it means. Here's another possibility. In those days, people commonly wore amulets that were sometimes made of white or precious stones. These were like good luck charms. Sometimes these stones would be inscribed with the secret name of a pagan god. And the ancient world believed that the names of the gods had mystical powers and that if you knew the name, the secret name of a god, it would give you special access to those powers and you could claim help and protection from that god. Well, if that's what was meant here, then what Jesus is promising to these who believe him and who hold faithful to the end, he's promising a stone with a name engraved, the name not of some pagan deity, but the name of Christ. The name of Christ that is more powerful than any pagan gods. Jesus is saying, in effect, you don't need a good luck charm to keep you safe. If you have my name written on your heart, you will be safe in this life and the next. Another way that the white stone was used was that sometimes on two friends would divide a white stone in half and each one would carry half of that stone with him and would have the friend's name inscribed on his half. If that's what Jesus had in mind here, then the white stone is a picture of a believer's friendship with Christ. 
with my name written on his portion and his name written on mine. Uh, the most common explanation I've seen for this white stone is that in these days, white stones were distributed by the Roman government as tickets to banquets or entertainment or games that the Romans would hold. And if you had this white stone, you could get into the event. And the point being that those who belong to Christ and who evidence it by declining the world's sinful pleasures, they will be granted entrance to that great banquet in heaven where they will feast they will find their joy and their delight for all of eternity in him. There are those who say that the new name to be engraved is the name of Christ. It's engraved on our stone. And if that's the case, it suggests that we will one day know him in a more clear, personal, intimate way than we have ever known him before. Uh, there are others who say, no, it's not Christ's name that's on that stone. It's our name that's on that stone. And you say, well, that's not a new name that no one knows. Well, it's the new name of who we are as a new creature in Christ, fully transformed into the likeness of Christ. And that that stone with a new name written on it symbolizes who he has made us by his grace. There's a new name written on the stone that no one knows, Jesus says, except the one who receives it. I think that secret name, whatever it is, is a sign of intimacy with Christ something that is only disclosed to the one who receives this reward. It's a picture of the intimate self-revelation of Christ that is promised to those who hold fast to him. It's a private, a personal love and expression of himself. And those who hold fast to the name of Christ and the truth of his word will come to know him in an even more personal, intimate, satisfying way in eternity and for all of eternity. If we have conquered in this world, if we have said no to the defilements and the pleasures of this world that are sinful, if we've said no to idolatry and no to spiritual adultery, we've said yes to Christ, we've stayed faithful to his covenant by his grace, then we have Christ's promise that he will manifest himself to us and he will completely satisfy our hearts, our minds, and our souls with himself forever and ever. And that's why we don't have to accommodate to the world because we have a feast coming. We have promised joys coming. We have hidden manna. We have that white stone that's going to give us entrance into that feast. All these promises are ours for all eternity if we will overcome now. When you swim against the stream of unpopular opinion, there is reward and rest ahead. Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth has been encouraging you to stand firm for the truth, no matter what other people around you are doing. Today's teaching wraps up the series, Compromising Truth. It's been based on the letter to the church in Pergamum that we read in Revelation chapter two. Now, there are seven churches altogether and Nancy's devoting a series to each this fall. If you missed any of the first three parts, you can find them all on the Revive Our Hearts app or at reviveourhearts.com. I sure hope messages like this one are helping you remember the reward we have in Christ and that we have so much to look forward to as believers. We can overcome any situation, any circumstance, because we know we are in Jesus and the future he has promised us is bright. It's the hope and reminder that heaven rules, something we've talked about quite a bit here at Revive Our Hearts. When we learn to believe that and live as if it's true, because it is, that changes our entire outlook on life. Here in the month of September, Nancy's book, Heaven Rules, is available to you when you make a donation of any amount. We'll send it to you as a way of thanking you for supporting what God is doing through Revive Our Hearts. Along with the book, you'll also receive a bonus discussion guide to use with a group or to think a little bit deeper on your own. Be sure to request your copy of Heaven Rules when you call us at 1-800-569-5959. That's 1-800-569-5959. Or go online to reviveourhearts.com. And hey, while you're on our website, I want to invite you to check out the brand new season of the True Girl podcast. 
We recently released season 10 called Becoming a Girl of Faithfulness. It's based on the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who said yes, Lord, to anything he asked of her. And we want girls today, 7 to 12 year old girls who are living in a live your own truth world to know that God's truth matters and they need to become girls of faithfulness. This podcast is based on my new Bible study, Mary, Becoming a Girl of Faithfulness. And the podcast and the study is perfect for tween girls, their moms, and any young at heart girls. So if you want to check it out or share it with someone you know. Again, you'll find that new season of True Girl on our website, reviveourhearts.com, or on the Revive Our Hearts app, or wherever you love to listen to podcasts. Jesus had some strong words to say to a church that was tolerating sin. Nancy will tell you about that when she begins the next part of our series on the letters to the churches in Revelation. That's Monday on Revive Our Hearts. Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, helping you experience freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ. Don't forget, when you get in touch with this program, please let them know that you listen to their broadcast on American Family Radio. Thanks. 90.5 KTXG Greenville, Dallas. As in church, for as long as I can remember, our pastor just said something about sexual sin. But a lot of the people that you sit next to at church, they don't know how to get away from this and they don't know where to turn. Because there's a lot of shame, rightfully so, attached to this. It's like, who do you go to? Who do you even talk to? Tune into Share Truth, Apply Scripture. Just visit EngageMagazine.net. This is American Family Radio, a listener-supported ministry of the American Family Association. American Family News, I'm Robert Thornton. House Republicans are looking to move forward in launching an impeachment inquiry against President Biden as soon as this month. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy told Republican representatives during a call earlier this week that this is the natural progression from our investigations that have been going on. Here's Fox's Lucas Tomlinson. Not all Republicans are on board. The House GOP holds a slim majority, and 18 Republicans represent districts Biden won. Here's James Comer earlier this week on why he thinks a probe is necessary. Joe Biden lies every day about his involvement and his knowledge in his family's crooked business dealings, and the day has come for the press to step up and accept responsibility that they got the story wrong. And Joe Biden does deserve to go through an impeachment inquiry to find out 100 percent of all the crimes that were committed by his family. This week marked the two year anniversary of America's hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan. President Biden went against the recommendations from his top military advisors and NATO leaders. President Biden has denied any accusation of being involved in business dealings with his son. And President Biden recently laughed off a request that his bank records be turned over to Congress. Fox News contributor Miranda Devine spoke with Fox News about the incident. Yeah, nervous laugh, or really the fact that Joe Biden has used a derisive laughter like that as a weapon all his career, and that's worked for him to sort of put off the questioner and show disdain for the question. Um, but look, if he has nothing to hide, he should be answering these questions mm. because they're coming thick and fast and uh, he's never, ever addressed the mountain of evidence that's being uncovered. And she thinks an impeachment inquiry may happen in the future. I do think it's inevitable, ultimately, that they are going to have an impeachment inquiry. That's certainly uh, what James Comer and, um, and McCarthy has said it as well. And that's what James Comer wants, <laughs> because um, at the moment they, they need a certain extra powers, like the ability to give witnesses immunity. Um, you know, people are frightened to come before the committee and they're being intimidated by the expensive armies of lawyers that Hunter Biden and his family have amassed. She also talked about emails that are not being released by the National Archives. And they are emails where Joe Biden has used various aliases, uh, I think up to five aliases, to communicate with his son, Hunter, including about uh, sensitive issues such as Ukraine uh, that Hunter was making, of course, millions of dollars from. Right. So uh, that's something that the National Archives needs to release. 
Although a full hearing is yet to be held, AFN's Charlie Butts reports a Texas judge has ruled that children can be protected from gender manipulation treatments. Legal advocates for trans-confused children filed a lawsuit against a Texas law that prohibits the medical and surgical treatments for minors. Jonathan Covey of Texas Values tells AFN the Texas Supreme Court has allowed the law to go into effect anyway. And this bill prohibits doctors from doing these kind of medical procedures, puts penalties in place. And the bottom line is doctors have a duty to help kids and not harm them. Kids aren't even allowed to go and buy medication cough syrup over the counter. They're not allowed to get tattoos. They're not allowed to go into an X-rated theater. That's because of the impact on their young and undeveloped minds. Plus, they typically grow out of the trans mode of thinking by their upper teens. Some of these people on the LGBT side and the advocates against this bill are saying, well, we should allow kids to have this decision over to whether to mutilate their bodies, to harm themselves when they don't have the ability to be able to assess the risk that they're getting into. They become adults, they want to go down that road, that's their decision. So children in Texas will be spared, at least until the outcome of a trial. I'm Charlie Butts. And in final news, on Wall Street, the Dow and the S&P were up at 115 and 8, respectively. The Nasdaq was down 3. For American Family News, I'm Robert Thornton. Too busy to catch your favorite shows on the radio? Have no fear, because the AFR app is here. Download the app to have access to live broadcast, music streaming, as well as each podcast. Whether you're at work, at home, or on the go, it's easy to listen to AFR. The AFR app is available not only for Apple and Android users, but also on Amazon Alexa and Roku. Download the AFR app today at AFR.net. Hi, I'm Jim Scudder. Today on In Grace, we're at Ancient Shechem. We're going to show you Jacob's Well and Joseph's Tomb. Welcome to In Grace with Jim Scudder Jr. He is the senior pastor of Quentin Road Baptist Church in Lake Zurich, Illinois, as well as the host of In Grace Radio and TV. Hi, this is Jim Scudder, and today on our very special Friday or weekend edition of In Grace, we're taking you to ancient Israel. <laughs> this is the fourth part in our four-part series, Discover Hidden Israel 2. Uh, this was one of my favorite series to film. This is an adventure where we go to Israel, and we're going to places that either I haven't been for a long time or I've never been to. Especially this one. We take my friend, archaeologist, Dr. Scott Stripling. He is a uh, archaeologist, obviously. He's the director of the dig in Shiloh. He also dug in a place that we believe is ancient I or AI. Uh, he has so much experience digging in Jordan and Israel. He's a, a, a professor. He's a provost here at the Bible Seminary in Houston. And he gives us several days every year where we can go and film and he shows us really awesome places well today is no exception we're going to take you to ancient shechem now you say where in the world is ancient shechem well if you've uh, read your bible you'll recognize that this is a place that some of the old testament characters were there even jacob um even after jacob someone was buried there that came from Jacob, and that's Joseph, the one that went to Egypt and really saved uh, his whole family and, and the, the Jewish race. And, and he said, don't leave my body here. When I die, bring my, my bones to Israel. And they buried him in Shechem. And we're going to visit today Joseph's tomb, which is a very volatile uh, and troubled place. But we got great access because uh, the country was basically shut down when we went to film there because of the pandemic. But we got some incredible opportunities to go into and, and actually go to the sarcophagus where they say Joseph was buried. And we also went to a place in that same town 
where Jesus was. He sat on the, the well of Jacob. So we know that Jacob would have been there, dug this well. Jesus went to this well. And while his disciples went off into a city, Sychar, or maybe it's the same Shechem, Nablus area today, modern Nablus, he ministers to this woman and he knows all about her and he offers her living water. And, and what an amazing place it is to go there. And I'm taking you there today to this ancient well and where we actually saw this beautiful water that's still coming up out of this well. And I'm reminded that Jesus is the living water. This is an exciting episode. I'm glad that you're along for the ride today. Right before we get into it, let me remind you that In Grace takes people to Israel. We do a trip or two a year. We've taken hundreds of people to Israel. Uh, the next two trips are full, but we, we have one coming up in February, another one in June. I think those are both full, uh, but you can go on a waiting list for both of those. But we have another one in a year and a half. So if you're interested in going to Israel in February of 2025, you can contact us, ingraceradio.com, click on travel. Also, I'd like to send you Discover Hit in Israel to the entire series that you're hearing the fourth part of the episode today and if you give a gift of any amount to in grace i'm going to thank you by sending you this exciting full-length four-part video series by dvd or digital download if your gift is 35 dollars or more i'm going to send you discover hidden israel one two and three and for those of you that can give more a hundred dollars or more i'm going to send you eight adventure videos from israel contact us today just call us, 800-78-GRACE, or go online, ingraceradio.com. You can also write to us at InGrace, P.O. Box 9, Lake Zurich, Illinois, 60047. As Scott and I are exploring incredible sights and fascinating stories relating to Israel and the Bible, we travel north out of Jerusalem for about two hours through Samaria, arriving at Nablus. This bustling city is the location of many things in the Bible, and we start at a venerated spot, Joseph's tomb. Because of the pandemic, when we arrived, the gate was locked and no one was around. But our driver, Riyadh, went looking for someone who would be able to give us permission to go inside and maybe even fill. And while we waited, Scott and I talked about the significance of this place. We're standing here in the middle of Nablus, and we're at a very important, significant place. The place behind us is... Yeah, this is the tomb of Joseph. You remember the last five words of the book of Genesis in a coffin in Egypt, talking about the bones of Joseph, and he made a promise... When you leave from here, you're going to take my bones with you. And the place that he's buried is part of the territory of Manasseh. Right. So he has two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and they both get massive tribal allotments, by the way. And so we're in Manasseh territory right now, Mount Gerizim on this side, Mount Ival on the other side. We're in the middle of an ancient Shechem, or modern Nablus, and this is the site of the tomb of Joseph. Joseph is included in Hebrews, in Hebrews 11. Yeah. And it's not for what you would think it would be for, you know? Because there's so many other things that he did in his life that you would think that he would be included. But it was because he said, don't leave my bones in Egypt. He was so convinced that God was going to fulfill the promise made to his great-great-grandfather right. grandfather, and all the way to him and to his people that, hey, I'm coming with you guys. And this is proof of that. It's really neat because those bones are so symbolic. The, the fact that they're carrying them out, that's a connection with their past. The future's lying ahead. They're dealing with the present, but that's their past. We're also in a place that has a lot of other significance, right? Because Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they all had connections to this part of the country. Right. And Shechem is also the place that Jacob's well is, and that's a place that Jesus came to. So you have multiple layers of history happening here in this location. So you mentioned uh, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, a very important place in the conquest because it was the third place that they came to. Right. After Jericho and I, they came to Mount Ebal. That's right. And Mount Gerizim, actually. And they worshipped, saying the, the blessings and the cursings right, back across then. the mountainsides. That's right. And we're heading to that spot. Riyadh came through 
and we were given permission not only to go see Joseph's tomb, but have the rare opportunity to film inside by ourselves. You are standing where very few people get to stand. I mean, you're talking here about Abraham's grandson, and the role he plays in Egypt is so critical, and the fact that the book of Genesis ends with in a coffin in Egypt, and then it just sets it up for Exodus. They carry his bones all the way to Jericho, to Gilgal, to Ai. They come up here, and then they take care of this interment. So they come to this spot. What a reverent, holy thing this must have been, you know, to have these, these bones of this patriarch. And they came here, and they buried him on this plot of land that Jacob had, had purchased. Now, what we're looking at is a cenotaph. So this is a marble uh, sarcophagus that is, think of it as kind of a great marker. Now, underneath us, what there might be, I don't know, and I don't know that anyone in modern times knows because they would kill us if we tried to remove this to find out. So the, the tradition comes back to this, this spot, and within our lifetimes, there have been battles fought here at the Tomb of Joseph and shots fired. And, but I think for the audience, there's a real faith lesson and a sense to me of solemnity, of holiness, that our ancestors, it's not just that Joseph was their ancestor, He's my ancestor, he's your ancestor, and he's mentioned in Hebrews 11. And we will get to meet him. Yeah. One day. Well, he's part of a great cloud of witnesses right now, probably thrilled that we're having this conversation. And I also love it that what the Bible describes, we find in the world, we find yeah. at the place where the Bible said it would be. And this book was written so many years ago, but it's accurate, it's correct, and it's powerful in my life and in your life. And I think there's just evidence, so much evidence of the truth of the Word of God. Yeah, so true. When we think about Joseph in Egypt, Potiphar, with his role with Potiphar, with Pharaoh, his wife, Asenath, and his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So it's just such a critical transitional figure. And I also think of Joseph as one that had it tough. You know, I mean, he went from That's being right. the favorite son to almost being killed by his brothers being sold by his brothers. Can you imagine what Israel or Jacob would have gone through thinking that he had died all those years? And then you're enslaved, and then you're accused falsely, and then you're imprisoned, mm -hmm. and then you're forgotten. I mean, just think of all those things and how quickly I would have just said, forget it, I'm done. But Joseph did it. And he's one of the few in the Bible that we don't really read anything, uh, anything bad about. That's right. That's right. Now he's arrogant in his youth. He's sure. hubris. And and when we read the Bible, there's a lot of ways we can read it, but one way is as literature. So we analyze character. So is this character flat or round, static or dynamic? And 